Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Tips from the Pros. I am your host, Jonathan Barbera, and I'm very excited about this episode because ever since I got started in real estate, I got started back in 2011, 12, kind of studying it and reading into it, and everybody had become big through short sales. And in New York, one of my first, I guess you can call them mentors, he built his whole business on short sales. And then when I got to San Antonio, one of the courses, the only course I ever bought was from a guru that got his whole fame on short sales, because that's the best thing that happens when there's a crisis. You do short sales. You know, it's a great strategy to know. So it's always been in the back of my mind. I've always been intrigued with it. Um, we've done a few just to test them out and it's a great strategy so i'm very happy to have on uh uh, not only a broker but a woman that's been doing this since the 08 crash she knows how this works um and she's just the best source of information that i can bring to you guys on this topic so i'm very excited to introduce mrs angie francis welcome to the show (laughs) thanks john happy to be here so Short sales is a very fun topic, but before we get into that, what made you get, what were you doing before you got into real estate and what made you make that transition into real estate? Yeah. So, um, before I got into real estate, I was a manager of a medical office. Um, my husband, Dan, which some of you might know him, um, (laughs) he, um quit you know left his job I was working and he would call me and say Angie you should quit your job you should start a business you should all this stuff and I'm just thinking I'm the one with the paycheck and the health insurance and what kind of business would I start so um so you know we we talked about that after after some time and I like to say I either got fired or I quit depending on who you talk to uh I left that job and I thought maybe I should get into real estate so got my real estate license just because we saw that there was a lot of advantages to having um a real estate license in house at the time Dan was using another real estate agent she was great very very investor friendly. Um, but as with most agents, um, she also had her own life and her own business going on. So wasn't always necessarily available for Dan when, when he needed, um, you know, good deal. Uh, something comes up. So got my real estate license at the end of 2006. Um, and we started doing a lease with options to purchase. Um, and then the crash hit and, um, uh, that's when we really got into short sales. So my very first listing was a short sell listing and uh, I've done, I don't even know, I've either listed and or processed hundreds of them for sure since then. Wow. Um, and why short sell? Was it just purely, uh, it was thing of the market, it was a opportunistic or was it like something that brought you into short sales? Like what made you choose short sales? Yeah, well, it was it was opportunistic at that time. You know, we we were experiencing the crash. Um, we, our first, you know, like I said, our first option when we started investing was to do um, leases or you know w- lease options, purchase to buy. Um, the Texas legislator passed some uh, rules that made that really a risky prospect to do. Um, so that combined with the subprime um, collapse, uh, there was there was just a a lot of short sales and a lot to be taken advantage of. Um, Dan and his partner at the time had already kind of been um, getting into short sales. Um, other investors had been getting into short sales. And back then, um, uh, investors could actually flip or, or not flip, but wholesale um, the short sales. They would get their offer approved and uh, and then they would go some, find somebody who would pay more for it. So it was just part of our, um, you know, investing strategy. And it was what was there at the time. I mean, that's a big part of investing is what is the opportunity right now? What's allowed within the law? Um, and you just have to be flexible. <laughs> you have to be flexible and and uh, be willing to change course. Um, and short sales was where where it was at. We were making lots of money on short sales. Um, yeah, we, we did pretty well. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> within the law, that's just a, a funny little point in there. <laughs> we like coloring a little bit at the edge of the law. Yeah. 
Well, it's all, you know, it's always a big deal, though, because the Texas legislator could make a, a rule, you know, one year that could completely mess up your business plan, which is exactly what it did for us with um, lease, lease purchases. Right. So could you explain uh, in a more layman term, what is a short sale? Sure. A short sale. A lot of people say it's a misnomer because there's nothing really short about it. It's a very long process. Um, but essentially, a short sale is when the um, the borrower has gotten behind on their payments. They're facing foreclosure generally, but they owe more than they can sell the house for, pay off the loan, um, pay the closing costs, pay you know any liens that are outstanding on it. Um, they can't sell it. They can't sell it without coming to the to to the table with money. And so with the short sale process, essentially the borrower or slash seller asks their lender to allow them to pay less than the full payoff and, and essentially forgive the difference. Um, so that allows them to sell the property um, zero out of their pocket, but zero in their pocket. The lender takes a loss, but the lender and the seller are avoiding a foreclosure by doing the short sale. And do you have to be a real estate agent in order to do a short sale? Every, uh, I, sh I guess I shouldn't say every, there, there's sometimes uh, some lenders, you know, oddball lenders out there. But for the most part, the lenders will require that the property be listed with a real estate agent. So you really do need an agent um, uh, involved in the process. Okay. So when you guys started, that you were you were a real estate agent, and that's why you guys were able to handle it. So what does the process actually look like? So, you know, we're most likely getting into another crisis that we're going to need these. Um, what does the process look like? What is somebody that's perfect for a short sell? You know, what's the qualification to qualify them as a short sell? And what does the steps look like on your end as an agent? Right. Sure, sure. Well, and as a real estate, um, I guess, investor or agent, you can identify a short sale essentially by somebody who's upside down, underwater on their mortgage. They have some sort of financial distress that has made it difficult for them to make their payments. Usually it's a permanent situation. Um, uh, they don't have any uh, expectation that their income level will come back generally, and they're facing foreclosure. So so they, they owe more than they can they can pay off and they're facing foreclosures, essentially the recipe for a short sale. Um, I know sometimes investors will come to me and say, well, couldn't you do a sub two on that? Um, and you can, but, but the difference between a really attractive sub two and a short sale is, while a sub two, you can be a little bit upside down. Usually a short sale is quite a bit upside down. Sub twos are really great to capture a little equity and maybe get into a, a seasoned loan. Um, but short sales are usually too upside down to make that an attractive position for an investor. And sometimes when they're that close to foreclosure, the reinstatement's a little higher than it would be attractive anyway. Um, the process though, so once you identify a short sale, um, you know, they need to get, the seller needs to get with a listing agent to prepare a listing agreement, um, the usual listing documents, um, and then they'll also need to provide additional documentation to the lender. Essentially, the seller had to qualify to get into the mortgage. They have to qualify to get out of the mortgage. The lender doesn't want people to just walk away from their mortgages because they changed their mind about the house or, or whatnot. They want to make sure that the folks are in, in true distress. And so there's quite a bit of paperwork that the lender wants um, in order to kind of substantiate that distress, which includes like financial statements, bank statements, tax returns, uh, pay stubs, that sort of stuff. So you really need an agent who's familiar with the process, knows what to collect. Um, essentially, they, they collect all that paperwork, they send it into the lender at some point, sometimes right away or sometimes after it's on the market for a while, an offer is received. Um, the seller, you know, signs off on that offer, assuming, you know, the terms look reasonable sends it to the short sale lender. Um, and then the short sale lender is reviewing both all that paperwork plus the offer. Um, and, and that's usually where the weight comes in because, um, generally loss medication departments are short staffed. They don't, 
make a lot of money for the bank. And so, and especially in good times, um, you know, like we've had, they certainly, the loss mitigation departments are certainly scaled down. So it's just a long process. They've got a lot of boxes to check. And, uh, you know, like I said, it's, you had to qualify to get in, you have to qualify to get out and they're just not as anxious to get you out as they were to get in. So the process takes a little longer. So, yeah, I, I, yeah, we've been, uh, involved in a few short sales and they're quite a long process i think the quickest one we had turnaround was like seven or eight months um yeah i'd say that so i'd say six to nine months is a pretty good average um i've known them to go on for i think i had one that was almost three years one of my agents had one that was just over three years um they can get really tedious was that sure. in new york <laughs> Is that was that in New York? Is that what you said? <laughs> yeah, sure. Because uh, foreclosures and short sales in New York take like four to five years. Do they really? Oh my God! It wasn't in New York, but you know, it's like just uh, a recipe for everything that could go wrong. Mm. <laughs> you know, mm. can go wrong. So um, yeah, it's a quite it's quite some time sometimes. So you're dealing with the seller. Um, you you establish they need motivation. Like just them wanting to sell is not enough. There needs to be actual financial distress for the bank to even consider a short sale. So if they're about to face foreclosure, that we got fired or something like that, that would consider as financial distress. Yeah, you know, generally, generally the lender's not going to really look at a short sale request unless the folks are at least one payment behind because they're not going to be too excited about taking a loss on a performing loan. So while while people say you don't have to technically be behind on your payments, the chances of them looking at a short sale request if you're not behind um, is pretty slim. So it usually you need to, you know, be at least one, one payment behind. Um, as far as qualifications, you do have to provide all that financial um, information. However, I've never had a short sale um, be denied because they felt like the person had too much money. Um, usually with people facing foreclosure, not making their payments, they don't have extra cash. You know, they can definitely show a financial, you know, hardship, whether it be loss of income, divorce, death, illness, you know, any, anything. Um, so I don't, you show, you, you want to show that they, they can't afford their, their bills. People can usually do that. Um, but are they really, it, it doesn't happen very often. And I guess I should say that they turn down somebody for lack of distress. Yeah, uh, it makes sense. Now with this forbearance thing going on right now, right, that they're doing the forbearance. So a lot of people thinking that, okay, I'm okay. I don't need to make any payments you know, for the next three months and I'm going to be fine. Um, is all those missed payments essentially, because that's what it is on the forbearance, uh, would that already constitute in that distress apart once the forbearance is lifted and they do fall into foreclosure? Yeah, yeah. I'd say that quite a few of the people that we see come through with short sales have already tried to do a forbearance or a modification um, and have failed for some reason or the other. Either they couldn't keep up with the payments on the modification um, or it wasn't uh, it wasn't modified to, to where they could manage the payments um, or, you know, the, the it got added on to the end um, for some some reason like I said if it, if it was a temporary you know very temporary situation that caused you to get behind and you feel comfortable like you can make up those payments and catch up then then that's a good scenario for a forbearance um, but if this is a long-term situation if you're you know struggling month to month and there's nothing on the horizon showing that your situation is going to change um, then then a short sell is a good idea but you could that people can definitely try forbearance and modifications first. My only, I do, I do uh, offer some some suggestions as to make sure that the the sellers understand. Or I'm sorry, the borrowers, homeowners understand um, the uh, the terms. Are they going to have to pay it back? When do they have to pay it back? Is it added onto the end? Is another lien? Um, and so it's really important for them to understand the terms and to know that the lender can you know keep on with foreclosure proceedings um, if if they can't you know if you can't abide by the terms of the forbearance and whatnot. So you could still be looking at a foreclosure, um, even if you try to go that route. Mm. Yeah, that's where I think most of the, 
I, I, it's messed up to say opportunity, but it is. It, for us investors and everything, it is going to be an opportunity coming up, uh, even though for them it's going to be a tough situation. But that's what I think is the great thing about short sales, right? Uh, it's that, yes, it's a tough situation, but you're giving them an out that's not a foreclosure. Right, because can you can you compare the two, the short sale and a foreclosure? Like how both are going to affect your credit. But I mean, obviously, foreclosures is ten times worse. So I mean, how do you go ahead and explain that to the seller when you're talking to them? Yeah, yeah. So with a foreclosure, with a foreclosure and a short sale, both of them, you are going or the the borrower is going to be incurring those late and missed payments um, reported on their credit um, every month, and that's the real doozy. You know, when you're late on a mortgage payment, that's that's kind of the worst thing you can do as far as credit um, is is involved. Um, so so in both situations, you're you're accruing those late and missed payments. If you if you have a foreclosure on top of that, it's just like just the extra whammy on, on top of what you've already done. So another deduction of credit points plus a foreclosure on your record. Um, in Texas, uh, or not in Texas, in, in general, um, you're going to probably be at least three years, maybe more, um, to where before you can qualify for a mortgage after a foreclosure. If you do the short sale, then you kind of, you cut, cut the losses off, um, essentially. So as soon as the short sale is completed, then, then those late and missed payments, they're still going to be there. But at that point, you can start the clock um, to 24 months, which is the general under, underwriting guideline for um, qualifying for a new mortgage is that you can't have been late on a mortgage for 24 months. So you've got a two year waiting period, but you don't have have to also regain those points from the foreclosure um, plus the foreclosure on your record. Um, and, I, and I don't have any proof to this, but I think that lenders um, prefer to see a that somebody you know tried to take care of the problem didn't just walk away didn't just let the house foreclose um you know that they they worked with the lender to to come up with the short sell solution um so it will show up on the credit report as as paid it may show as a settled debt um but it's going to be much more um easier in the long run to rebuild rebuild your credit and it's been it's been very um um, uh, satisfying to have people that back in 08, 09, I helped with a short sale come to me, you know, in the past few years telling me that they're qualifying for a house, they need some, you know, a HUD or something from that short sale or whatnot. So they do come back to me and let me know that they're buying houses again. And, um, it, they're they're a unique population some of them are bitter and angry but then some of them are just really grateful for the help and to have somebody that's going to help them navigate through this process wow uh, i i agree i think you know within the lack of options at that time and i i understand why some people think that you can probably do a subject two but if it makes sense for a subject two then it doesn't make sense as a short sale like a short sale is just that's your only avenue at that point is you got to short sell the property um, I think that would be best for the for the seller if they have the option to do sub two because your their credit's going to just be built back up so so quickly with that reinstatement and the the mortgage payments they're still looking at that twenty four hour uh, or twenty four hour twenty four month um, you know period before they can qualify for another loan um, but it, yeah if there's enough equity to do that that's a good idea yeah so when you're Setting up with the seller, this was, uh, I, like I said, I did a few short sales and the experience I've had is it's a very tedious process with the seller and they mm -hmm. really need to be motivated themselves. Not just, you know, that they're going through a tough time, but they really need to be motivated because I have had a few sellers that I had to talk them off the ledge of saying, screw this, let it go into foreclosure. I'm done dealing with all this nonsense because it was so much paperwork and it was so many things that the banks was asking that you know I, I was starting to lose them so like mm -hmm. when, when you're talking to a seller for the first time and you're uh, and you're explaining to them the short sale process how do you kind of prepare them for the amount of work that's coming ahead especially from them yeah well uh, I kind of tell them the same thing about you know you qualified to get in so you have to qualify to get out um, the lender is going to want to have you prove this distress um, and unfortunately the lender isn't super motivated to 
take a loss, you know, so we're really going to have to work with their systems. Um, and, and we have to continue to submit documents as they request them. We have to play by their rules. Um, so I just want to prepare a seller and it's usually the same things, you know, they might ask for, or the lender might ask for updated pay stubs, tax returns, bank statements. Just save all that and be prepared to send it to us when we need it. Um, or be prepared to re-sign something, redate something. Um, the lender, you know, the loss mitigation department, it's really just this giant checklist that they want to have completed. They've got, you know, a rule of underwriting requirements from the um, investor on the loan, essentially. And they're just going through and checking all the boxes. And everything has got to be within generally last 30 days and so if you submit a short sell package it gets put on the desk of a loss mitigator under a hundred others by the time they get to it it's probably all going to be outdated they're going to come back to you or they're going to say oh this form changed slightly they're just checking a bunch of boxes and so it's super frustrating and there's a lot of let, there's a lot of turnover. So what you sent to one person next week, you might have a new negotiator who doesn't know where any of that stuff is. <laughs> Again, this the loss mitigation department is not a money making department for the banks, and so they're not really well equipped in most cases. Um, so so they just have to be prepared and know that that is just part of the process. They have to be engaged, um, and I think if people know that ahead of time, they're they're more willing to to be engaged in the process you really do want sellers who are motivated to avoid that foreclosure um, because otherwise it's just going to be a frustrating experience for both the, everybody everybody involved um, so uh, yeah that's that's the best thing I can do is just prepare them really the number one reason there's two reasons why short sale fails two top reasons um, and and one of them is uh, seller cooperation um, sometimes the short sale lender you know you talk to your negotiator and she's like okay I've got everything I need except for this one thing and I need it within 24 hours or I need to close the file and they will do that to you no rhyme or reason they're the bosses <laughs> like you have to go by their rules and so if a seller's not right on it you know we could lose the short sale over that it could be denied and sent to foreclosure so I just let them know that being prepared and being timely with that stuff is really important um, but yeah I can't tell you how many you know close or uh, short sales failed just because the seller got, you know, to where they didn't want to do it anymore, got frustrated or just weren't quick enough um, in getting the documents to them. So it, I think preparation for that is, is the best way to hopefully avoid um, that pitfall. And I take it that's where you want to be dealing with an experienced agent that understands how to do this, because I'm sure yourself, when you go, you already kind of prepare them. You say, Hey, we're going to need your pay stubs. We're going to need, you know, a, a letter of hardship, you know, all these things that we're going to have to you go getting it ready because we know the banks are going to ask for all these things. So at least you're yeah. going to go preparing them and it's not always one more thing and one more document because that's that's kind of why I, we were about to lose them because it was we were getting the notifications like, oh, now we need this. Hey, we need this yeah. now. And she's like, damn it again. You know, so I was <laughs> like, I'm sorry. I've never done this before. <laughs> But um, yeah, do you it's have kind of like a, a checklist that you give them. Yeah, yeah, we have a we have a you know a seller package that we gives on that we give them, and it has a list of everything that we need. And then when we're with them, we'll check it off or make a note. You know, I usually leave a little homework for my seller. These are the things that you didn't give me yet that you need to provide to me. Um, and and we provide them just other like FAQs and and information that really primes them again to be prepared to give us updates, to resign, redate things, be available available at a short notice um, so yeah we try to give them all the tools they need for a successful short sale yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense and I think that's uh, it, it makes a lot of sense to just have ready just to make your life easier because uh, you know it's such a tedious process that it, it helps a lot when you can just say hey here's a checklist that way it keeps you on task of everything because but this lady again like every time we were asking for something it was you know I got to go find it and it's at, and she had abandoned the house so she had um, left so much stuff behind. I mean, it, it was a nightmare. But yeah, I mean, having a checklist, we can get all those things ready and it just makes the transaction much smoother. Um, does the seller get anything when doing a short sale? Do they get 
any compensation, anything that you can at least maybe use to help them out? Yeah, um, good question. Good question. Generally, I will tell my sellers not to expect anything. Mm. Um, there was a time, you know, with the uh, the affordable home, HAMP, I guess, um, that that there were some uh, incentives or relocations offered by some lenders and got kind of high in some cases. And I'm not sure what exactly um, uh, made them offer such large, large relocation incentives, but those have essentially gone away. So I would always tell a seller not to expect any money. Sometimes um, FHA will provide like a thousand dollar relocation assistance to encourage them to go through the short sale process rather than foreclose because foreclosure is a lot more costly. Lenders don't want foreclosures, right? So um, sometimes they'll offer that. I never tell my sellers to expect that because if they're behind on their mortgage, they're often behind on HOAs or other fees like that. And when it comes down to the end, we have to clear everything off and get every lien, everybody who owes money um, paid off, settled, or somehow released. And so um, the lender may not agree to pay all those late due or late fees, HOA fees, or other you know things that the seller is responsible for. So sometimes if there's that relocation incentive, we can apply it to some of those fees to clear off some of those debt debts that the seller owes. So I always tell them, you know, if you get anything, it's a happy surprise. Do not count on anything. Um, which I guess, you know, some people can be like, well, why would they do the short sell in that case? Um, so some of the um, advantages to a seller pursuing a short sell instead of foreclosure um, would be that during the process, they're not making any payments. Um, at some point, the lender won't even accept payments when you get so far behind. But like we were saying, you know, an average short sale caught, you know, lasts six to nine months. That's six to nine months of living in that property and not paying a mortgage or taxes or um, insurance. Well, hopefully that's all in the escrow. Um, so that's, that's an advantage. Also, generally a seller doesn't need to pay for anything. They don't have any closing costs. They don't pay any commissions. That's all covered by the lender um, as part of the process. So the lender, essentially the lender um, will uh, tell us what they will allow us for closing costs and most of that is is um, commissions and stuff like that so the process is generally free for the seller and so that's probably the best benefit. We're going to save you from foreclosure. Your credit is going to, you know, be um, much better in the in the long and the short run. Um, and you get to live here for free for a while. So save your money and be prepared to move. Um, so uh, yeah, that's that's probably the best benefit, and that's frankly pretty attractive to a lot of people. And just the um, the. Uh, the lifting of the anxiety of what's going to happen if they go to foreclosure, you know, this kind of gives them a little more control in the process. We have a closing date in mind. They actually close it. They're a participant in the process. Um, so it's just, you know, I think it feels a lot better. Um, I know a lot of them have very scary. You've experienced that. They think that, you know, they're getting foreclosed on on Tuesday and Wednesday morning, the sheriff is going to be there pulling out their stuff. And so just having somebody that's finally helping them with the process and talking to their lender on their behalf, somebody who understands the language that's really attractive to sellers too i think no uh, it completely is and i always try to tell people when they're asking them about negotiation tactics and stuff i always tell them like don't give them too many options because they're calling you because you're the expert like they want you to tell them what to do because th this is not their business they don't understand like you do you need to go in confidently and show them like hey here are the steps i'm here to work with you you know, we're on the same side. We're trying to figure this out. And then they'll be more cooperative because, I mean, again, this situation is very long. It's dragged out. And there are times where it's dragging out for months and they start losing their patience because they kind of want, they even though they got themselves into this, they want closure, right? They kind of, they're like, all right, we want to do something now. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, you know, it still takes a couple more months. So, yeah, it's tough. But we do have a, a question from uh, Chris Ramirez. And she asks, 
We have, she says, hi, Angie. We have worked with a few homeowners on short sales and found out weeks into that that the lender would not accept it because we did not meet the deadline for applying. What advice can you give to help investors avoid this from happening? Yeah, that's really a good question. And um, if that's Chris with a K, I know Chris. Yes. I've bought a few houses from her. So uh, bring me another one, Chris. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so so that is a tricky thing. And that is not something that we really saw in 2008, 9, you know, 10. Um, some of the lenders, you know, every lender has, an, uh, you know, every loan has an underlying investor. And that investor is going to have their own uh, essentially underwriting guide, guidelines for short sell requests. And, um, and lately, it seems probably within the last year or so, I've been seeing these um, lenders doing that to a lot of people saying that we need the request. And I think it's Mr. Cooper specifically 37 days prior to the foreclosure date. Well, most people don't even know that they're getting a foreclosure at that time. So it's like they put this impossible overlay um, on some of these loans. And so um, uh, I've had it too, Chris, where I've done it and, and sent it all in. And I'm like, 30, so you got to be joking me. And it's almost like some of them purposely don't receive things in time or whatnot because they don't really want to do the foreclosure process. I mean, think about it when, when the market is good, when the market is good, lenders are more likely to want to foreclose because they may do better on the open market than they would, you know, shorting. So it's really just a, um, they're looking at the options and deciding which one is a better option financially for them. And in this good of a market, they've decided foreclosure is a better for them financially. And so I think that's why they put those really strict overlays on recently. I feel like if the, if, if our market changes quite a bit to where there's much more distress, I feel like a lot of those overlays will go away and, and it'll be much easier to get a short sale process. Um, my, my suggestion to you would be to just get familiar with what those, who those lenders are. And before doing a full on short sale package with somebody, um, you might, if they're within, th if they're within 37 days of the foreclosure, I would call the lender, get on the phone, you know, you can either get an authorization to release information and call um, the lender yourself, that's going to take a few days. I would probably get on the phone with the, the seller right there, call the lender, ask them if there's any specific um, timelines for a short sale submission. You can just do a three-way call with the seller right now and get on the phone and just confirm and verify. Um, that's my best advice, but at the same time, they could totally lie to you and give you wrong information and you can do it all <laughs> and then be told at a later date that for some fantasy reason that your short sell is denied. So um, I would just, uh, I wish I had a better <laughs> response for you, but um, there's a reason short sales have a little bit of a, a bad reputation. And, and a lot of it's because what we do have to deal with on the lender end. So um, if you're worried about that, or if you're that close to foreclosure, um, I would just call the lender and, and ask to verify if there's any rules like that. So sometimes depending on the situation, I might, I'm sorry, John, I yeah. might just go ahead and yeah. submit the file. Um, I mean, if you're willing to put the time and the effort in crazy things happen, you know, you could submit it. And for some other reason, the foreclosure gets postponed and then you've got your package submitted in time. So, um, you know, if you're a go getter, if you got plenty of time, then I would just probably submit them. Um, but if you're like, ah, I don't want to waste my time like that again, then, then maybe just a few preliminary phone calls would help help but no promises so it, with that re regarding that with the lenders um are there can you do a short sale with any property or are there certain lenders that they're just it doesn't matter what it is they're just never going to go through with a short sale yeah so lenders aren't required by law um to do a short sale um and and they're not doing it because they like you it's a loss leader does it make more sense to foreclose or take the short payoff now? Um, and that's all they care about. So m that said, almost all lenders will do short sales. I can't 
think if I've experienced anyone who said they couldn't. We've even done them on reverse mortgages um, before. We've done them on loan or mortgages that had IRS liens attached to them. I mean, you can pretty much do it on, on anything. Um, the bigger banks are probably a little bit more difficult to work with. If you get like, I've had, I've done them for USDA. That was a really easy one to do for some reason. Um, sometimes credit unions are a little easier because you just got one guy, but then sometimes you got one guy that doesn't know anything or, you know, so um, yeah, essentially all lenders will do them, but there's no, there, you know, there's there's nothing that they owe the homeowner by any means. They don't have to do them if they don't want to. So and that's with, why they can put their own individual overlays on it. Yeah. Right. And with VA loans, same thing. Yes, you can do short sales with VA loans too. Yep. Okay. Very nice. So moving on a little bit here. So looking at it more from an investor's point of view on this, um, I understand that as an agent, you know, you you have your process, but as an investor. Um, we did buy a house uh, through short sale process and um, it was a hell of a deal great deal um, but you you have that kind of negotiation part with the bank right so you gotta either send them like a repair bid and all this like how do you guys uh, you know in the in, as an investor how do you handle the bank when it comes time to kind of trying to get that price that you're looking for Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess I would preface that by saying that it's not very common that I will see an investor friendly offer be accepted by the lender. Um, because again, they are looking at their options. In how are we going to do? Will we do better at foreclosure than with this 70% minus ARV offer? Um, generally, they're going to decide the foreclosure looks better. Um, that said, it's not impossible. And I've bought short sales myself as well before. Um, I'll say the most promising short sales for an investor are going to be those that are in just really bad disrepair, um, major issues that are going to require a cash buyer. The lenders can kind of recognize that when it comes up. Um, you know, major foundation issues. I've also found Found that they're a little bit more amenable to short sales if there's some sort of litigation going on between the um, borrower and the lender um, or the borrower and the home or the in the home builder um, I've seen uh, short sales be a little easier in those scenarios um, so just to you know to say that so that you don't think that you can find this you know nice little three, two in a cookie cutter neighborhood that just needs maybe a little paint and that you're going to get a great deal on it. It's not going to happen. Um, you know, so, so in those cases, um, sure you can try to make an offer. It doesn't hurt the seller necessarily to take an offer, but the lender is not, not probably not going to, unless you're looking for buy and hold and, and a minimal, you know, discount, then, then that's probably not going to work for you. However, with those that do have quite a bit of repairs needed, then yeah, you can definitely help the process um, by providing repair bids. If you've got an agent that's for, is also an investor and familiar with short sales, they'll probably also, or you can provide um, photos of all the damages, um, uh, repair bids, um, you know, you can provide your own comps if you want to. Essentially, the way the lender comes to their uh, comes to a decision about what they will sell the house for is they are going to have either a BPO or an appraisal done on the property. Um, and, and a lot of times it's a BPO because they're cheap. If you don't know what BPO stands for, it's broker's price opinion. And essentially it could be a brand new agent who's making $75 to drive by the property, take some photos of the property in the neighborhood, and then tell them what they think the house is worth. Um, so maybe not the most um, competent person doing it. And if they don't even go in the house, how do they even know? So so that's why it's really great to get all those repair bids and, and, and stuff like that. If you have a good listing agent, they will also list it in a way that kind of um, – uh, 
markets it as a distress sell, kind of list it where you want that price to come in at. And I feel like that'll probably influence that BPO officer a little bit because again, they're kind of newer. They might not be super confident in their abilities and they might kind of lean towards that listing price feeling like, well, somebody else chose that. So I'll go with that. So, um, but sometimes it is a full appraisal that, that goes in. Um, but, but yeah, if you have all that stuff to show them so that you can substantiate, you know, that value and show them that this is like going to be a lot of work, um, then, then that can help influence both the BPO agent. Um, and if we get a bad drive by BPO, we can go to the lender and show them the photo show them this, show them that and ask for like a full interior BPO or just actual full appraisal. So that'll give us some ammunition to do that. Um, but we really want the, uh, the, the bank's opinion of the value to be as low as possible so that we have the best chance to find a buyer who will, who will close on the property. So um, that's an important part of the process. So, so leaving the repair bids just lying on the table there wouldn't be a bad idea when the BPO agent goes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could definitely, you could definitely do that. I mean, I let my sellers know, like if somebody comes, I tell them about the BPO or the appraisal. It's very important that I hear about it if somebody calls you to do that so that I can talk to them and share those details with them. But if they're just a drive by, you never even know they went by. So in those mm -hmm. cases, we send that stuff also to the negotiator on the file. Okay. Now, yeah. With that said, so let's say we have a, a big crisis come about, right? So you don't have those retail buyers as you did. Would at that point, even though the house is not trashed, but the fact that the only person really buying is an investor, would they accept a lower offer at that point? Or would it still make sense for them to go through foreclosure for the bank? Yeah, I mean, they're really going to be looking at, at market um, conditions and and I'm sure they've got some sort of formula. <laughs> some mathematician has created some formula for them to let them know, you know, where they need to be at, and what would be the better option. But I do expect as values and market goes down, the lenders are going to want to cut their losses if they feel like they could have more potential losses through a foreclosure. So I think it will loosen up a little bit. Plus, there won't be as much market demand. And, um, investor offers will be easier to come by. So I wouldn't say like, don't try a short sale. Um, but I'm just saying like, so, you know, if it's in this market, if it's just really easy to comp it and it's just clearly, you know, uh, just a little bit of work, um, then they're, they're probably going to want more. I mean, just to give you an idea of what the lenders are thinking. So for FHA, you, everybody knows what their formula is. Um, it's, they want to net 88% of the market value. Um, and so if you think about that, they need to net 88%. That means with your closing costs, which you have to add in, um, your, you know, if you got 6% agent commissions and maybe another 2%, that's 8%. So if they want 88, then, um, then you're not really getting a big discount off of that. So you're essentially getting what a six percent discount. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so it's not so to a homeowner who's you know starting and has a limited budget, um, a six you know five six seven percent um, discount is attractive. But to you, I'm guessing not so much. No, no, not at all. No. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> can you wholesale short sales? No, you can't really wholesale. So I know that disappoints everybody. I wish I had a better answer for you guys. And that, that was how investors made so much money back in, you know, 08, 09, 010. We, we were wholesaling them and it was perfectly legal. Um, and the lenders were fine with it. A lot of times the lenders knew um, that we had another end buyer who was going to buy the property. But that was at the beginning of the subprime um, fallout. And as time went by, the lenders started to notice, you know, that a lot of these were getting wholesaled. So um, they essentially put an end to that by um, 
putting a lot of restrictions on resale. Um, they they make everybody sign an arm's length affidavit at the time of closing, saying that there's no outside agreements. They are, you know, generally there's a resale rule within like 90 days, um, or that you can't sell it for more, and you know, within 90 days in the in the deed records. Um, and then they are qualifying a specific buyer. So if it's not that buyer, you know, when they go look at the final HUD, um, it's a it's a no. They won't let the closing happen. So so they just really tighten that up because they're like, hey, we we don't <laughs> we don't want that. We want the excess monies. And so now there's not a lot of opportunity for investors other than to purchase um, um, short sale opportunities. So um, yeah, that's kind of a bummer. There you know there are some people out there who um, have figured out a way to to do something similar to a wholesale. Um, but I wouldn't want to give away their secrets here. <laughs> oh no, what a tease. Why not? Is it illegal? <laughs> no, not illegal, not illegal at all. I mean, I'm sure people could, could, you know, figure it out, but, um, uh, essentially what they're doing, they're doing with the consent, um, and approval of the short sell of the short sell lender. So, um, but, but yeah, for investors, the opportunity is purchased. The opportunity is to refer it out to your favorite realtor and then maybe get some realtor favors in return, CMAs, good relationships, um, you know, maybe a referral back later. Um, so, um, that's really where the opportunity lies. Or if you are an agent as well as an investor, list those boogers. I mean, I I made so much in commissions on short sales, even when they stopped stopped you know letting us wholesale them. I still made a ton in commissions. Um, you know they stay they pay full price even though a short sale you still get your full three percent commission. Um, if you don't want to do all the tedious work, there's a lot of companies out there that will do the work for you. Um, and then you and then you do a two percent commission to the buyer's agent to cover the cost of that essentially. So if you want to do it, you know, if you want to make the money but le be lazy about it, then definitely, you know, um, uh, push that out on someone else, take the listing. If you're an investor, you are, especially if, if our market takes a downturn, you will get short sale leads. Absolutely. You'll get short sale leads and you can either walk away from them. Um, or if you have a real estate license, you can very quickly, you know, switch gears from investor to listing agent and say, let me list it for you. Um, put it in your pipeline. Yes. It takes some effort. Um, but, uh, but it'll, you know, it'll pop out as a commission later, plus give you some great experience and exposure. So list now, them. You, you guys at, at Stepstone, you, you handle the short sales for your agents, don't you? You, you have the yeah. back office for that? Yes. So yes. How, how does that work for your agents? Well, um, actually, we used to um, process uh, the short sales internally um, with a staff member, but now we've actually outsourced to somebody that um, we're pretty confident in, someone else that loves short sales as much as I do. Um, and so, so uh, right now, it doesn't cost our agents anything. Um, I help them with it. I provide them lots of education and training with um, short sales. Um, and then that other company um, helps us just with the negotiations, the frequent calls, that sort of stuff. And we have that arrangement where we'll do a 6% commission, offer two to the buyer's agent, 1% to our processing company. Um, so doing it that way, you know, takes a lot of the, the time and effort off of it. And it's really, if you're able to, you know, just offer a 2% commission to the buyer's agent, um, you know, it's not really costing you anything out of your, your income. And then the uh, remaining 3% goes to your agent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the listing agent will get three, the buyer's agent will get two, and then that leaves 1% over that can be used to pay for those processing services. Uh, that's a hell of a service because, I mean, you still get your 3% and you don't have to go through any of the, of the headaches because they really yeah. are headaches. <laughs> that's kind of why I decided to, uh, yeah, outsource that. Um, I definitely could do it, but, um, and having done, you know, I always think it's a good idea to do things a few times before you outsource. I'm pretty sure I've heard you say that before, um, too, but at the same time, if you're new to short sales, you know, as far as my agents go, I know who I'm outsourcing them to. So I've come, you know, I have 
a comfort level. And I know if anything sideways happened, I'd know about it. Um, uh, so my agents don't have to worry about that so much. But just, you know, it, it, sometimes it might be a good practice if you got some time just to, you know, process a few yourself to see what happens. <laughs> no, and I, and I think you made a, an excellent point because, you know, as the market turns, when you start marketing for leads, I, when, even when I came to San Antonio seven years ago, um, we were still dealing with a lot of foreclosures and a lot of people falling behind. And we did a few short sales at that point. Um, and that was kind of towards the tail end on this side. But um, we were still getting a lot of short sales. And you're already paying the marketing. Like, why not monetize on those deals? That's why yeah. I, I, I do recommend people that to just get your license or do what I did. That's a little bit cheating. You get a partner that got their license. Um, well, Dan both. <laughs> yeah, Dan, I was about to say, Dan thought the same thing. Uh, but yeah, getting a partner that has their, their license because it just opens up your opportunity so much more to get more deals. I mean, the, that short sale that we did, that was the house was very distressed. That's why I qualified. But we essentially wholesale that we bought it but then we put it right back on the market we made like 50 grand not doing anything to the house it was a hell of an offer from the the you know the counter from the bank and everything we're like holy crap you know yeah. so not bad at all to have that strategy in your pocket yeah um, sometimes it really works out in your favor because like i said the bpo agent could return a really low value or you know in the bank they, they trust that number, you know, they got to be able to trust their third party, you know, because they've never seen it. They're not coming to look at it. They trust whatever that third party valuation is. So it makes it hard when you get one that's too high because the lender's like, well, of course you're trying to talk me down. But sometimes you get lucky, especially when your name's Jonathan Barbera. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we ended up meeting the BPO agent there. He comes down from like this very douchey looking Jeep with like flip flops and like this Hawaiian shirt. Like he was pure, like on vacation and he didn't look like he knew anything about real estate. And so we went through the house and we're like, look at this really ugly beam. Look at the black mold over here in the corner. And we scared the crap out of him. And he was like, wow, this house is really messed up. We're like, yes. So, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it, we didn't manipulate that guy. We showed him what it was, but he just didn't. They have no idea. And if I think if you don't spend that time to kind of meet them out there and walk them through the things that you see, you're, you know, like you said, the banks rely 100% on their opinion. And it's an opinion. Like, that's also the scary part of it. That they don't know what they're doing and they're giving their opinion that's going to dictate whether you get it or don't. Right. And if you think about it, it's, it's usually an unexperienced and a retail agent that really has no idea what these costs of repairs are going to be. I mean, agents tend to think in terms of what's the current market value. What can I sell this for? And you know, they love pretty stuff. So ugly stuff with lots of repairs that, you know, that'll throw them for a loop for sure. So um, usually they have a much worse opinion of what it's going to cost to, to get all that done. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely intimidates them. Now, another benefit that I've seen a lot of people take uh, with short sales is when they're doing a short sale and the homeowner actually has left or leaves the house and they do what is called home tendering, right? So can you explain what that is? Um, yeah, sure. So home tendering, um, the, essentially the lenders would prefer the homeowners to stay in the property. Um, they don't, you know, it's not a qualification for a short sale. A lot of times people need to move for a job or whatnot. But generally, you know, the borrower is still responsible for the property, for the maintenance and the upkeep of it and whatnot. And so if they move, if they've had to go out of town for a job or something and left the property vacant, um, it's really not good. It's, it's dangerous for the property. You know, nobody's there to see leaks, vandalism, you know, condition issues. Um, it looks vacant. The yard becomes overgrown. Inspect, you know, and then you get it under contract and people want to do inspections. Well, who's going to turn on the utilities if it's vacant? Um, and so in general, um, it's just better to have somebody in the property. So home tendering, some, some companies have set up uh, home tendering services to where they will uh, lease out the property um, to a home tender. During the listing process, um, the home tender will get a reduced 
commission or reduced rent um, in return for maintaining the home, maintaining the yard, keeping the utilities on, keeping it occupied and nice showing condition. Um, and then they just have to be prepared to move with a 30 day notice. Um, a lot of times um, the homeowner won't get any of the rent. It's essentially the folks who are setting up the home tender, who's setting up the leases and managing them and stuff. But a lot of times the sellers are, are just thrilled to have somebody looking after it. And I don't have to pay for all that. You're going to turn on utilities and manage the yard and stuff. Um, so that's really a, a great a great option when when you got a vacant property yeah and we're not going to get too much into it but i just wanted to throw it out there because i think uh i definitely saw people use it back then and they did set up their companies on it and it was just i thought it was genius i was like damn yeah. that's that's all cash flow right there i mean you have yeah no yeah. expenses no well, nothing yeah. Well, you know, Dan, you know, Dan did start a company to do that because Dan didn't want to uh, miss an opportunity to start a company. But <laughs> what does he have, like 15 right now? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Ask the accountant. Um, <laughs> um, but but uh, I, it's not real popular now just because there's not as many of them. Like you can't really, what are you going to advertise to people when you got two properties to fill? So I think if we see a lot more short sales um, starting to hit the market, if we see a, a lot more distress, then that'll definitely definitely be something that's that's available um and out there again i think people will start doing it again so with the with kind of finishing up the short sales um what are some potential pitfalls that uh, agents investors should keep in mind when dealing with short sales like what are some things that they should watch out for i think um the worst thing to encounter is either an agent or investor is the professional foreclosure avoider. <laughs> they, those folks, you know them. Yes. If they if they call you and they are two years behind on their payments, <laughs> they are a professional foreclosure avoider. Um, yeah, I mean those people, they just kind of learn the process, they learn the tricks, and what you find with them is they will do the short sale, they will tie you up for nine months, twelve months. Um, and then as soon as the short sale gets approved, all of a sudden they're not interested in doing a short sale anymore. So no, never mind terminating. I'm not signing that contract. So you just wasted a bunch of time and then they'll move on to their next, you know, strategy, bankruptcy or TRO or whatever, whatever the next strategy is. So I would say that that is the biggest pitfall is you, is you find those. And I think in our current market, those are more prevalent because I think in the market we're in, it's so good that you have to try really hard to be up and down right now. <laughs> so it's usually those folks that are, are just severely behind. Um, other pitfalls is like Chris mentioned, you know, you can just do a lot of work and then the lender just flat out says no for no reason whatsoever. Um, so there can be a lot of, you know, work involved that doesn't pay out. Um, and the sellers, you know, on one hand, they're, um, they, it can be very gratifying to work with somebody who really is motivated to avoid a foreclosure, but then it can also be really painful because again, sometimes people aren't really, you know, motivated. They're not, they don't see that they're getting anything of the house. They're angry and mad at the situation. And, and those sellers can be really hard to work with, maybe not very motivated. So you're not going to have necessarily a nice looking house to show, or you might have some showing issues. So I'd definitely say it's, it's lack of motivation. The sellers, the lack of motivation or whatever their, you know, their, their motives are can be a real bummer, I guess. <laughs> a bummer. A bummer. A bummer. It's a bummer. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, with short sales, I've always said, you know, put them in the pipeline, put them in the pipeline, so especially if you have somebody that's processing for you and they'll start popping out the other end eventually. So, um, you know, it's just, uh, you always want to fill your pipeline. You never know if it's going to turn out to be something or not, but if you put enough of them in there, um, you know, they'll start coming out. We had about, we had a around a 90, 92% success rate when we were processing a lot of them. Um, and again, you know, the, the foreclosures usually occurred because the sellers got unmotivated, you know, a seller issue, or we got a bad appraisal or a BPO that we could just couldn't find a buyer that would be willing to pay what the lender wanted. Mm. So there, there, there is no 100% success rate with short sales. 
No, and I would never promise anybody that you will uh, guarantee you will stop their foreclosure. I mean, those those banks are fickle. The loss mitigators have a thankless job, um, you know, so uh, you just got to do your best and dot every I and T and put a loan number on every dang thing you send and fax it five times and cross your fingers. <laughs> yeah. And now with the foreclosure, so let's say you have what's probably going to be happening. You have a spike in foreclosures. Somebody calls you, they're going to lose their house in two weeks and you run the numbers and you're like, this is a short sell all day long. What would be the next steps for that homeowner or yourself to do to delay it enough to start the short sell? Would the short sell process delay the foreclosure or do you need to do something else? Yeah, generally the short sell process will um, stop the foreclosure. It essentially puts the seller into the loss mitigation department versus the foreclosure department. Um, every bank has their own guidelines as to when a, a short sell needs to be submitted prior to foreclosure. Sometimes, like, like we were talking about, one does 37 days. I don't know where they came up with that number. Some of them are like two weeks or five days. Um, so my, my my advice is to move quick like the closer to foreclosure the the less your window is for successful short sale so that window is constantly closing as you move up to the date of the foreclosure so the so my advice is to work fast have everything submitted to the lend. don't leave out anything make sure everything is complete um there's no blanks everything is hand signed um that's your best chance if you've got a foreclosure coming up that quick um work quick and work correctly and get it in there okay but you can i mean i've had people you know we've submitted short sales a few days before foreclosure um i call those hail marys Anything within a two week is hail mary. It's like we're gonna we'll give it a try, but and you gotta have somebody really motivated that's you know that's calling the bank, that's faxing. You got this, you got this. So um, it's possible, it's possible. If people get too close to foreclosure, um, uh, you know, then then we can always recommend maybe a, filing a bankruptcy or a TRO to to pause it, and then that will usually give it enough time. Then it's you know, in the short sell process. And then most of the time the lenders won't reschedule that foreclosure date. Although sometimes they do cancel and schedule for next month cancel. So you're every month you're sitting there trying to get them to, you know, pull that foreclosure date. Um, it just depends on, <clears throat> it depends on the lender. FHA, once you're in the, in the system, um, then, then you're good until, until they deny the short sell. So, but they all do it a little different, but my, the, the more time in front of a foreclosure you have, the better. That's my lesson. Yeah, for sure. But, you know, these sellers, they, they like to wait until the week of and then be like, oh, my God, I'm going to lose my house. You knew you were going to lose your house. You know, but mm -hmm. that, yeah. that, that's the business we're in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I had a question from Christina. I don't know if you know Christina Fuller. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Oh, yeah, sounds kind of familiar. <laughs> it says uh, sellers have to be on board throughout. Can you share what happens to short sales when sellers flake? Oh my gosh. Well, the agent gets really frustrated. Um, <laughs> the buyer and the buyer's agent don't understand what happened. Um, yeah, it's just that can be a really frustrating situation. And sometimes they do flake. You know, this is not a fun experience for them. They're disgruntled. The bank is, you know, mean to them. Um, essentially, it fails. You know, if the, if the short sale lender asks, for um, a document and it's not um, given in time, um, then they'll just close the file and then the file will go from loss mitigation over to the foreclosure department. Sometimes you can get it reopened, but um, again, you're you're trying to go on an uphill battle if you try to get it reopened after they've already closed it. Um, so at that point, you know, you can cancel your listing agreement if you think they're not going to participate any longer, or you can just sit on it and wait for it to foreclose and then close your files and move on. Yeah, makes sense. And and Roger had a question. He says, you can buy personal property from them, like a five hundred dollar toaster. Oh, <laughs> why are you trying to get me into those gray areas, Roger? Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I said, you will have to sign 
um, something at closing that is a legal document, an affidavit saying that there's no side agreements or anything like that. Um, you know, if you were going to buy some property from them, then I think that would be just a personal transaction to the side. It shouldn't be a part of the short sell transaction. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and you have to be comfortable signing that arm's length affidavit. So I probably wouldn't do a toaster for 500, but, you know, more reasonable, I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I'm telling you, you're in a gray area right there. So you'd have to make your own decisions. You know, toasters are expensive nowadays. Sometimes you guys. On the to- I mean, are we talking like a toaster oven or just a toaster? That- yeah, um, it, it could be a very, you know, sentimental toaster. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so let's play a little Nostradamus here. What, what do you, what are your opinion on what's coming down the line from, uh, this whole COVID crisis and everything? Like, what do you think? Um, and, and we're not getting political. Okay. <laughs> Just, what, what do you feel with, uh, with the economy? Like, especially for Texas, what do you, do you think this is going to get tremendously worse? Like 2008, like what, what, what are your opinions on this? Man, I you know, I don't know. I, I hate to I hate to hedge uh, bets, um, but personally, I just feel like um, I worry that we the worst is not behind us, um, and that in our in our anxiousness to get back to normalcy, which I also feel um, that that we may backslide a little bit. But I'm not a scientist or politician. So I I don't know, but I feel like if that does happen and people have prolonged loss of unemployment or loss of employment, then yeah, it could could get bad. It could get really bad. Um, Will it be bad as as bad as it was in 08, 09? I don't think so because the the qualifications of our current buyers are not propped up you know they really were qualified buyers and so it'll be purely you know the uh, health uh, you know a health emergency that turned into a, an economic emergency um, but uh, you know we got good mortgage you know good borrowers still lots of need for homes we're still low on inventory um, you know we lots of people want homes but there wasn't the inventory there so that bodes well for a, you know a quick recovery but um, you know I don't know I think it, it really will depend on on whether we see another resurgence and have to have another round of shutdowns. And if that happens, it may go for a lot longer if, if we feel like we reopen too early. So kind of too early to say, I think, but I think that regardless, there's going to be some people that unfortunately won't be able to bounce back from this. So there will be, I feel some distress there. Um, uh, how much? I don't know. What do you think, John? <laughs> oh, I think it's going to get very bad. <laughs> I, I, I potentially, I think that's going to be worse than 08 because unemployment, I think, is going to be through the roof. Um, you know, a, a lot of businesses trying to reopen. A lot of them are not going to be able to reopen. People are going to be scared, not going out spending. Um, I think all those things and, and then just <laughs> the government giving away so much money. It's like that's going to bite us in the ass at some point. So I don't I don't know. I'm I hope it none of that happens because as as many times as I always hear investors always say, you know, oh, I hope for a big crash because that's when you get rich and I'm like, no, you get rich if you come out of the crash. But like during yeah. the crash, I think everybody suffers. You know, and it's like I I'm not looking forward to something that bad because I think it's going to be hard on everybody. Like I I mean I think we're all going to struggle to some extent during that. Yeah. Well, and you know, um, with the mortgage rates like they are, they don't, they kind of took away all their options to, to adjust those rates to spur, you know? So I do kind of feel like they, they jumped the gun on that one a little bit. They, they got no more tools in the tool shed. So that's a really good. Aside from printing more money, they don't really don't have anything else that they can throw at this. So I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But, and, and I feel I feel your sentiment. You do feel kind of like a vampire, right? When yeah. you're a real investor right now. And it's like, man, you don't hope for people to do bad, but you do want to know what the options are so you can help them. Like, you know, Dan used to say, like, we people, you know, people don't 
don't get on doctors when people get sick and like, oh, you like when people get sick. No, it just happens. We just happen to be in this industry. Um, whether As a real estate investor, you cannot depend on a, a, a bad economy and like here it comes because the economy will get good again. We've had this huge or housing market. And we've had this huge stretch of good times. Um, so, so you have to be fluid and flexible enough to be able to make money um, and do deals no matter what the economy is. Is. And so I don't know how, how people are, you know, if people are going to adjust to it, um, in, you know, investors or whether they're going to leave the market because of the uncertainty of it. Um, but yeah, I think you're, I personally think if you survive this good time, then yeah, you're in a real good position, but you, you got to be ready to be flexible and change, change your strategies and meet the sellers where they are. I think that's something that a lot of investors do is they're like, I want to do this. And then the, every seller they meet, they try to put them in that box and, uh, you just got to be flexible. And, and this, you know, a change in the economy is definitely one of those times where a lot of us have to switch gears for sure. Yeah. Now, what do you think, what would be your advice to, let's say a new investor, somebody that's just coming in right now, they want to, they feel like this is the time to jump in. Uh, would you tell them you should definitely get your agent's license as well so you have more tools, start wholesaling, start with, like, what, what would your advice be to a new investor? Um, I would definitely tell them to get their license. I know that's a shock to you that that's what my advice and, would be. Put it under Stepstone. And specifically, yes, get, um, join Stepstone Brokerage. Um, and I know I, I know I joke about that, but um, honestly, I think, like I've said before, you have to be flexible. You have to have multiple options um, because because this is a, a tough business, and you want to provide people with the option that's best for them. And by having your real estate license, you just have more tools in your tool belt. Um, and so uh, I think that's number one. And number two, um, you know, the the community and the training that we have at Stepstone, I think, prepares people to be agents and investors. Um, if you're an investor and you're on on the fence about getting your license and you think, I don't want to get my real estate license because I don't want to drive buyers around every day. Um, please feel free to call any one of my Stepstone agents and ask them if they buy, drive buyers around all day. You know, really having your license is, 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 is as long as you're right with the right brokerage, you use it for what you want to use it. Um, uh, there may be brokerages out there that make you drive buyers around, but there's lots of brokerage choices and, and, and ways that you can carve your own business out while having your real estate license. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's what I would say. And I would learn all the techniques that you need in this market. Um, uh, you know, learn how to wrap, learn how to assign, list, and uh, I don't know, keep. Keep what you can. <laughs> right. You got to walk, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> up with that but yeah that's uh dan dan is a clever person walk with stepstone um, yeah walk stepstone i know yeah so i don't know if i delivered it <laughs> yeah no you I hit all the letters so <laughs> i wonder if he's watching he'll let me know <laughs> well we, we, you do have a little message from uh one of your awesome agents lj he says hi angie so oh hey lj <laughs> <laughs> um last question what are the top books that you feel have shaped your mind and or your business the most? Mm, what has shaped my business the most is definitely traction. Um, we definitely, you know, put that into use. We follow it and it's been um, it's been great. So definitely traction. Um, Dan is the bigger of um, the business books. And so I'll read what he tells me to read. He's going to proofread them for me first and then tell me. Um, my favorite book is, if anybody's looking for a fiction recommendation, is A Prayer for Owen Meany by uh, John Irving. I thought that was a really great book and transformative. And it's kind of an interesting book to read in today's time and age so if you're a fiction reader let me know <laughs> so, so my wife will probably go pick up that book she loves fiction books and she's always looking for a good one so yeah yeah for sure all right well angie that is all the questions i had for you um 
thank you so much for for coming on and sharing everything that you have uh it's again like we said at the beginning short sales i believe is it's an amazing tool to have and to understand and i think you did a great job on breaking it down and answering all the questions at least giving everybody a good crash course and do do you guys at step selling i believe you guys do a workshop right on short sales and stuff yeah, I've got a CE class out available right now um, that is listing short sales. Um, it would be a great primer for an investor or an agent. Of course, investors don't need CE credit, but that doesn't mean they can't sign up and take the class. Um, so you can go to stepstonetexas.com. And along the top, there's a tab that says CE classes. So click that and then there's a button to see the upcoming classes you can register for. So listing short sales, um, which is just essentially kind of an introduction to short sales. Um, so that would be a great um, option for anybody who wants more information on them. Um, and if you are an investor and you come across a short sale and you need a listing agent to work with, um, please reach out to us. We've got agents um, who are familiar with short sales in let's see, Austin, San Antonio, Houston, DFW, and Corpus, and, you know, Colleen, the kind of the uh, surrounding areas and stuff. So, um, but if, if I don't have one of my, one in my area, I know lots of great short sale people that I can also refer you to. So feel free to reach out to me. Um, my email is Angie at stepstonetexas.com or broker at stepstonetexas.com. Either one works. Um, but yeah, join us for a class and send us your short sales. We'll list them for you. Right. We'll do our best to get a, a nice offer approved for those investor friends out there for us, and we'll do our best for you. Yeah, there, there's simply just no excuse why you can't take advantage or seize the opportunity that's coming. I guess the, maybe that's a better word than take advantage, but uh, there's really no excuses. I mean, there's plenty of information, and like Angie says, they, they give those CE classes that they have all the education, everything on there. And I know that they answer your questions. I mean, it's a great group to be a part of. That's why so many of the people I interview are stepstone agents because you guys hold them to a different degree of, uh, you know, that, that they got to measure up to. So I, I've seen so many agents out there that are investors and they're just so shady. I mean, <laughs> it's just, it, it's not fun dealing with them. So. Thank you yeah. for what you do. Thank you for, for having Stepstone and, and, you know, keeping such a great realty going and everything you guys keep putting out for all your agents. And thank you for being on the show. So if you have any parting words. Um, I thought I had something, but then you made me, for, you talked over me and I forgot it, John. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, I was going to say, you know, we at Stepstone, we really want to – set the bar for how you act as an, an investor and agent, because we can, whether you're a stepstone agent or not, you know, it's, it's important to do business with a high level of honesty and integrity. And that's how you last in this business as well as flexibility, treat people, right. Treat your coworkers and colleagues. Right. Um, and I think, you know, our relationship has been great. And I think that's why, because we just have a great mutual respect for each other. And um, it's always fun working with you. Yes, you too. So thanks again, Angie. <laughs> Hope to have you back. And hopefully next time I have you back, you know, we're talking about how great the market is and how listings are killing it and how investors oh, are my, doing great. My lips are just flying off the market. Yes. 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 <laughs> All so. those luxury parties and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so thanks again, Angie. Hope you have a great night and hope to see you again soon. Thanks, John. Bye, everybody. Bye, Stepstone Agents. Bye, Black Sheep. <laughs> All right, guys. There you have it. So. Angie gave an amazing class, an amazing crash course on short sales. Um, it, it's a, it's really, I, I, I understand how involved of a process it is, but it is definitely worth knowing. And if you are an agent, you need to understand how to do this, even for the sheer fact of just referring them if you don't have the time. I mean, there's so many other ways that you can monetize on these and that you can help people out. And that's really what you should be in this business for is to help people out. I think what Angie said about um, what Dan had mentioned that, you know, doctors don't become doctors because they like sick people, right? They, they want to help. And that's why we're in this too. So I hope you take it with the same kind of mentality that you're here to help. This is, you know, even though in tough times, there's still a way out for a lot of people. So take it serious. Check them out. Uh, I'm going to put all their information on the show notes on our website for their CE classes, their Facebook page. 
jump on there, get to know them. They, they're they always giving out a ton of great value and a lot of great people are part of this group. So thanks again for watching and I will catch you on the next episode.